Good morning, everyone. Again, this is Nick Franco with Acumera. I am the Senior Director of Channel Programs here at Acumera, and I wanted to welcome everyone to our first in a series of webinars um, geared really toward the service contractor community. Um, this, this installment is going to focus on installing the Gilbarco Secure Zone Router. Um, I, I do notice we've got a, a bunch of folks on this morning, and again, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to, um, uh, to attend this. What we're, we're hoping to accomplish today on this uh, on this webinar is provide you some additional information and tools that'll help uh, you when you're out in the field installing the Secure Zone router. Maybe information that you haven't you know seen yet. Um, bear with us. This is our this is our first that we've done. Um, so we really welcome your feedback on you know topics and um, you know tools and, and, and things you've seen what you know work what you felt was really helpful in this uh, in this webinar and what you felt really you already knew wasn't really all that helpful so if you if you notice in the uh, bottom right hand corner of the webinar there's a chat window um, so if you could uh, as we as we go through these slides um, please uh, chat that we will be stopping periodically throughout this uh, uh, webinar to answer questions that have been chatted to us and suggestions uh, we have with us here today uh, Slade Clack. He's our uh, manager of technical solutions. He's going to be the presenter. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I'll take over this presentation today after everyone has been um, presented. All right, and we also have Danny Mosier, our um, senior network administrator. So uh, Danny is in our network operations center. Hey, everybody. This is Danny. Um, so again, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, Again, we'll be pausing um, periodically to answer these questions um, as you chat them. And then also we are recording this uh, webinar so that um, after we're done, we'll go ahead and get it out to everyone um, and you know, look forward to a, a productive uh, morning. Thanks, everyone. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Slack. Slade, sorry. <laughs> Everybody's laughing Slade. here. This is why we're going to try to be informal today. Yeah. Um, so uh, my name's Slade, and I noticed a few guys that are on right now. I've met you or have uh, been involved with in some types of installs with you. Um, so it's glad to see you guys are on here. Um, a few of our partners, um, I see that they're on here. Um, I've been in the industry for 20 years now. Um, I was Heritage Mobile, been in IT and operations for a long time. Uh, I've had Wayne plus threes, G sites, nucleus, and passports. And I've been on multiple installs prior to being at Acumera. For the Acumera knock, we're here to help. Anything that you need, um, just call in to ask us and we can provide some sort of answer or guide you to the place where you can find those answers. Um, so for the Gilbarco secure zone router, you know, what is it? And what are we trying to do with it? The SCR is a fully managed cloud-based firewall which protects the POS and any other devices within the secure zone router network. Um, as you add devices onto the network, we're going to connect those devices for you or help you connect them and secure them within that environment. And in the all-inclusive POS environment itself for basically any GVR device that you have. It also allows Gilbarco remote high-speed access into the POS for the purposes of troubleshooting. So um, that's that's one of the biggest things that we've seen so far is um, going from dial-up. I know Cybera had their own, but once you move to the SCR, we need a way to give them high-tech support, or Gilbarco does, and uh, very quickly because the old dial-up method was very, very slow. I know from my experience that if you were on dial up, it would probably take three or four callbacks in, you know, the, the phone line would drop and you'd have to keep calling in. So a, a high speed remote uh, session that would probably take upwards of or, or less than five minutes with dial up, it took 15 or 20. Um, why is this happening? Basically, Gilbarco wants a fully managed firewall with managed switches. What this does is simplify PCI DSS requirements for customers. It helps that standardization for the secure zone router network. You know, devices are named the same. They have the same policies. There are a bunch of other things that we can do to help standardize, standardize that for the customer. One of the primary reasons that we are moving to this platform is for site device visibility. Within the secure zone router, you know, Gilbarco is able to see what's going on in the network before they weren't able to. The RVO42 had... Um, no visibility, and you know you just couldn't tell where things were at within the location. 
Gilbarco is able to see the, the status of each device, the device is connected to them, and any issues that may need fixing. Um, why can't you connect or why, why cannot you cannot reconnect the RBO42? The existing remote access at some locations is persistent and unsecured. Well, what does this mean? The remote tunnel stays up all the time, and this type of situation can leave your customers vulnerable to a breach or, you know, as, as long as that tunnel's up, somebody has access to that network. It's also, um, part of it is because Gilbarco with the old RBO42, like we said earlier, they're not able to see devices connected to the network. So when they move to the new platform, they're able to visualize that. Um, for data breaches, let's think about the target hack and what we can learn from their breach. Well, what happened? A third party HVAC vendor had an always on access remote for remote support. Um, this allowed an agent or an attacker to compromise their systems. So how does the Acumera SCR fix that problem? Well, it allows access to only that which is needed. Um, and it's part of the PCI DSS compliance uh, for two requirements that you see within the slide, the 1238 and 1239. We allow remote access when needed, and we tear down that specific VPN tunnel after a specific amount of time. What's Acumera, Acumera's AccuVigil dashboard? So on the right-hand side, you'll see a little reflection of it within that, um, that monitor. The dashboard allows Gilbarco and Acumera access to the site for multiple purposes. Primarily, we're able to view and monitor the status of the locations, Green means good, red means bad. So you'll see that on that monitor, there's a red site. If there's red, that means there's something down. It could be the uh, the SCR, it could be the internet and a few other things where it's not able to communicate back to our servers. Um, for any issues, we can troubleshoot device status, communication problems, and any other areas of concern. For example, um, like I said a while ago, if you have a red site, that means it's down for whatever reason. Our remote connections app allows Gilbarco, and we'll see that in just a minute. Um, if we go back to the prior slide, you'll see that the on the activation side, we have a an app that allows remote high speed access, which turns on that tunnel for a limited amount of time for troubleshooting purposes. And after that time is up, it tears down that VPN tunnel for remote access. Like we said, dial up takes forever, and if if we have the visibility and the capability to to turn on a VPN tunnel via high-speed remote access, that should definitely reduce your downtime at those locations. So we'll move on to this. Uh, for the visibility, everybody's asking, what the heck is a square? Some people call it squares, some people call it tiles. It's whatever name fits you, but mostly it's squares, what we call it. And that's what Gilbarco references when they call in or they send us the site surveys. So the dashboard allows us to monitor and network the status of each device. We can sort these by block and list view. We can modify apps. So if we go within that tile or that square, we can modify apps. We can add or delete apps based upon the customer's um, support agreement. Um, we can create support tickets. We can manage users and alerts and a, a plethora of other things. So what you see on the right-hand side is actually what Gilbarco sees. They see green means good. Orange could mean that there is a device that's not responding. We have white tiles that have no um, secure zone router set up as of yet. Um, we also have some dark grays, but um, you'll start beginning to hear what we say in the Acumera knock as to what we're looking at. And hopefully this standardization helps everybody from the technician on site to Acumera to, to Gilbarco. Um, at this point, does anyone have any questions or comments? We'll take a look at the chat line and, and see if you guys have any questions. Okay. <clears throat> it looks like so far we're just we're <laughs> we're all good except for uh, except for the little glitch we had at the beginning. Uh, could, so, could, what we'd like to do is have somebody chat in and say whether or not you can see our our video because we're getting a few comments here about technical difficulties. I just want to make sure everybody's clear. We had something from, I'm just looking at it right now. Um, Great. We had something from uh, Chris, Christopher. 
And what message did you have? We didn't hear anything. No one replying. Yes. Uh, Christopher, are you able to hear us? Yeah, I think that's fixed at this point. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so from David, what are those uh, Gabarco switch templates and the ports that Acumera tells to use different? And whenever can you get around to answering this? We appreciate it. We can do that right now. Uh, so the as far as the the templates, I, I can't speak to what the Gilbarco help desk has said. What we look at it at the knock when y'all call in is which ones will work. Uh, so the biggest ones are like trunk ports and payment ports. So it's if it has a payment device, then it needs to be a payment uh, template. And it will always have payment in the in the full name, not like the 38T, but like the eight front payment, for instance. Um, same thing with the trunk line. If you have two switches, the first one has to have a trunk, right? Uh, because it has to be able to communicate back and forth. So if uh, it's just kind of a, a flag to let you know that if you need, if you have two switches, one of them's got to be a trunk. If you've got a payment device, one of them's got to be a payment. Uh, we do have a, a, a template selector tool that we're working on. Uh, haven't quite gotten to the point where we're ready to push that out yet, but uh, hopefully that will make y'all's lives a little bit easier. We do have access to it in the NOC, so we can uh, be glad to help you with it if you need. <laughs> and this is Slade. I'd like to reiterate something also that Danny pointed out. Um, we have a plethora of just multiple switches out there if you seem to have a problem or can't quite figure out what switch configurations or templates to use on the site survey just give us a call we're here to help absolutely um we we've seen uh like the 80 20 rule and it's really almost 90 percent of sites will use the same templates so that's that's part of the discovery process we know it's you yeah <coughs> excuse me all right Go ahead. I mean, let's go back to better state his question. He had another question. The port assignments aren't really that important. As long as the each port has a particular VLAN, uh, uh, VLAN that's assigned to it, uh, so like a, a separate network addressing. As long as, uh, say that you have um, two uh, CRINs, for instance, as long as you have them both in a, in a pay in a pay dev uh, VLAN, then it's fine. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, port five, port eight, but however, however it's it's uh, 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 set up. And honestly, that may be one that might be best. Uh, if you don't mind, let me try and get back with you offline. And I think I can maybe describe it, uh, help you a little bit better if we're actually looking at it as we go. Uh, and see. We've and, had a question come in about um, the, uh, the, voice, the voice not going through. And they want to know about the Gilbarco slide. Can you expound on that a little bit more? And we can always come back to that if you're yeah. not able to chat that right and now. Actually, I think let's do go ahead and move on. Uh, and we will get back to that, though. Uh, Misna, if you would, just uh, chat us on that and let us know what uh, a little bit more about what that is going to be. Um, and we'll move on and we'll get back to these next questions at the at the time we uh, okay. come up. So let's let's take a look at this one real okay. quick this is this is very good because this goes back to what the slides we were looking at right now are Gilbarco I'm sorry our technicians going to get access to AccuVigil that's one I think that's important for us and um, that'll be something down the road that will need to be discussed with Gilbarco if I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. and the access for technicians on site so you can reflect in and see what your site looks like but yes we will we will communicate that to Gilbarco and ask them for that functionality for you guys. Okay, so moving on, we're gonna look at site surveys. Um, site surveys help to ensure most, if not all, site discovery has been completed. When you arrive on site, you'll need to verify the number of devices. You know, is there, uh, are there three POSs? Are there three pin pads? Are there, is there a BRCM? Is, is there an applause server there? Anything that you can find out what is on site, notate that within the site uh, survey. Now, we've also had some ASCs out there that have said that, do you need to complete a site survey? Well, that would be the most helpful thing. And yes, um, one comment made to me by an ASC is, I know the store. I know the layout. I've been there multiple times. So that ASC may not necessarily have to go on site for the site survey because they know the layout. They'll know which type of switches they need. So that's something that you may want to use. You may not want to. Um, if you're sending somebody out to do a site survey, you know, 
figure out what's needed if they have problems, call into our knock. That's why we're here to help. We'll help you figure out what's needed in your store. Um, from there, you will need to determine whether you need a single switch or multiple switches for installation. You know, do you have different wiring um, requirements within there? For the SCR and ISP modem, are they in the back office? Is the POS device at the checkout counter? Is the BRCM and applause in the electrical room? The biggest um, issues I've seen at sites, and I've been on multiple site installs now, um, you have cable runs could be the issue. Do you have dedicated home runs back to the home, uh, the back office PC rack? Or is it an older site which only has a few cable runs, one from the back office to the front, and then another from the front to the uh, electrical room? So all of that comes into play. So if you think you're going to need one switch, you may end up needing three switches at that point because you don't want to have to run or you, you're not able to run extra Cat5 cable to accommodate the infrastructure of that older site. Like we said, make sure that you get all of that documented down and then you can call us and we can kind of help figure out which type of uh, front payment, trunk ports and things like that that you may need. Um, this is an example of a site, um, a, a few examples coming up of sites that I've been to. Um, you can see that this is chaos. Uh, it, this was actually a site that I was involved with, and you can tell that it's it's not a great site to be in as of this point. I wasn't able to tone out any wires. You see that all of these wires are here, but I wasn't able to tone out anything. So that's that's a problem in and of itself. So, when we so look what at, that is to say is that we feel your pain and we know what you're up against. Yeah. So it, this is another one. This is a uh, this right here is a rat's nest is what we all call it. And you have an unmanaged switch right there. So we'll, our goal is to take out that unmanaged switch and put in a managed switch so you know what's plugged in, or at least we do. And we can reflect into AccuVigil and see those devices that are actually plugged into that modem. Um, on the next slide, this is another example. There's more chaos. Uh, trying to tone out wires, figure out what's plugged in where if they're not labeled. That's one of the biggest issues that we've seen. So moving on, we're going to take a look at a little bit different of the site survey. One of the main concerns that I've seen and heard from ASCs is that the ISP modem. You know, uh, when you're on site, you want to verify connectivity during the site survey. The laptop is your friend. Always have it available for troubleshooting. Um, you know, one of the things to look at is the location IP. Is the location's IP static or DHCP? If it's static, gather that information during the site survey. Before you leave, verify that you're able to surf the internet. And if you can't, give us a call. We'll help you troubleshoot that. But we need to make sure or ensure that we have good internet connectivity so we can establish a link between the SCR and our servers to make sure that we can turn your site up in the least amount of time as possible. Um, the next slide is an example of a, a simple network diagram with a single switch. You'll see that there's an EDH, POS, and a pin pad. That's very simple. That's just an eight port switch, very simple. The next slide is a little bit more complex. It's an eight port switch, but it may use um, multiple dummy switches or expansion switches. So you'll have to determine what you need. Now, also remember that we have 16 port switches. So instead of using an eight port with dummy switches, you have the option to use a 16 port switch, which could encompass all of those devices within one switch. But be aware, make sure your cabling can accommodate that. If not, you know, like we said earlier, if it's an older site, you may need to use multiple switches. You can use any combination of these because we can, the, the way we configure it, you know, we have some sites out there that have five switches, some sites I think that have six switches, and it's all based upon the wiring within the location and proximity. Um, one useful thing that we've, we've seen in the past is a sketch or a drawing of the location. It can be very simplified. This is an actual drawing within the, uh, the site survey itself. You'll see that on the bottom left, there is the ISP modem and the back office PC and the secure zone router. Well, there's one wire going up to the front counter for an eight port switch, which has two POSs, two pin pads and EDH. And then in the back room, you have the ATG, the BRCM and the applause. So at that location, that customer chose to install three switches. 
and we help them determine that and which which type of switches would be needed and so forth. Um, so what's different from the RVO42? Non-passport devices like the back office PC and all um, that were connected to the auxiliary segment will now reside on the customer's network or the ISP modem. If possible, we'd like to have um, static IPs assigned to those devices. So statically assign an IP to the back office PC, the DVR, and that way we ensure that those device IPs don't change because when we add those devices into Acumera, if they're on DHCP and the IP address changes, you won't be able to communicate with the passport. That's one big area that we've seen concern with. Um, uh, he, here's an example of what we had earlier. So you'll notice that the store PC needs to communicate with the passport. If that device has a static IP, we'll be able to create a rule you know, within that, that, um, that POS server the passport server to allow communication to uh, send and receive XML files. Um, we had an installation yesterday where that that did not occur, and for whatever reason, they were on DHCP. The lease um, expired as we were cutting over the site, and we weren't able to communicate. And we figured out why. It's because it was on DHCP and not static. The other example that you'll see is that from the POS, um, follow that green dotted line over, and for that DVR. You know, some sites need text overlay and they need that data pushed over. And that's part of the, the, the passport POS security setup with the 10, I think it's the 10,001 port. So just remember that you'll need to provide the static IP information or the IP of information of the store devices in order for all of this to communicate properly. Do you have any questions or comments at this point? Let's see. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I'm coming back from the bottom. There's a question if it has to be a specific Netgear. Uh, yes, it does. We It has to be a GS-108T or a GS-716T. Uh, those are the only two supported switches on this. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so the question from Dave to uh, uh, kind of going back to the port assignments. Um, so at the, again, the port assignments are, they're not requirements. The, the device does not have to be in a very specific port. It's presented that way, I think, for ease of communication. Uh, the important thing is that the device is plugged into the correct port that supports that IP addressing. For like, for instance, the EDH is always going to be on a 10.5.50.2, right? That one has to be on the uh, port that supports that IP address. And so that one, uh, an EDH is always going to be on port two. That's always going to be the port that's set for that. The uh, passport server, always going to be on the 10.5.48.2. So that has to be on the POS segment. So it has to be plugged into a port that's programmed for the POS. Um, and so that's why that, that's where the port assignments come from. If you have questions about that uh, kind of specifically, is the better way to look at that, I think. Go ahead and call us at the knock, and we can help walk you through it. Because we can see what uh, ports are assigned for what IP addressing, and we can tell you where it needs to be. Um, and the only, again, kind of, again, a couple of uh, more questions asking about the specific switches. It is those only, it is only those two switches, the Netgear GS-108T for the 8-port and the Netgear GS-716T. Those are the only two switches that, that will work because they're the only ones that provide the visibility that we need. Um, let's see, the, from David asking about using ethernet switches for aux network, network devices. Yes, that can be done. Uh, a dumb switch that plugs into the Netgear, either the GS-108 or the GS-716, those are fine. It's only that managed switch that has to be one of those two particular ones. Anything that you're needing to branch out, so you, you need extra auxiliary devices, extra paid-out devices, those can be supported with just adding in a dump switch. And that's not a problem. That can be any off-the-shelf switch that you've got. And so, um, all right, I think back to Slade. Looks like that's everything for right now. Okay, so we'll, we'll head out to uh, pre-activations. Um, pre-activations are highly recommended. 
and that will help ensure minimal downtime. As you guys know, the steps for, to pre-activating are fairly simple. Connect the SCR per the guidelines that were given, call the Acumara knock, and they will provision the SCR and the switches. And then lastly, provide us with um, uh, the Gibarco via root ID, serial number, and switch templates, and then uh, provide any third party device IP addressing. Um, one of the things to remember is if you're in your office, if let's say you activate this in your office, it's easier to activate it there, allows us time to configure everything properly and ensure that the cloud light is on and every device that we have connected is functioning as it should. When you arrive on location, you know there are things that are unforeseen. Um, the internet may have worked whenever you were there doing the site survey, but all of a sudden it's down. And those are things we try to mitigate as far as turning up the equipment at your office or, you know, bring it home with you. A lot, we have a lot of uh, technicians that just bring it home and connect it to their internet make sure everything's up and running, I guess, because they can't get back to their corporate office in time. So yeah. anything we can do to try to help ease the installation prior to you arriving on site for the, the install, that would help. I think it's fair to say too, the only thing that we need to activate is, is a good internet source. As long as we're connected to somewhere where we can get internet to the SER, uh, we can activate it. And so and not to say that we have to do it beforehand, but it certainly helps. And it's like I said, recommended. Um, and as long as we've got open internet, we're good. This was an example from yesterday on an install that I was at. Um, there were three modems at the location, three ISP modems. And I asked the customer, I didn't do a site survey. It was done prior to. So I was helping out on this installation. And I asked, which one was your ISP modem? And he told me this one. So I connected my laptop. I was not able to surf. And then I asked the question, hey, is, is this correct? And he came back and said, oh, I'm sorry. It's not this modem. It's actually this one. And at that point, I was able to surf. So you may have run into problems like that. You've seen it all in the field. I have two, um, three modems. Which one is the one that I use? So just keep that in mind. Um, tools for installation. Um, what I've done with this is try to give you guys just a quick view of the tools that I use and have used in the past on installs um, with other ASCs. The laptop is the, pretty much the most important item that you'll need at that point because that helps you troubleshoot any type of internet connectivity. Um, I won't go through each one of these on the next three slides, but just take a look at them. They'll be available if, if you guys have any problems. The biggest issue that I've had, if you look on the right at that picture, this was an actual install I was on. And no matter how many wires we toned out, we cannot find the other end of it. So the customer now has to go and run more Cat5 cable because we don't know where the wiring is going in that store. Um, the next one is additional tools that I have that are recommended. Um, cable ties for one. The biggest issue that I have seen in the past, and I am a big believer of um, cable ties, is because you get those accidental unplugs. And somebody will say, well, oh, I didn't unplug it. Well, if it's tie wrapped, someone did it. So that, that's kind of one thing for me to you guys, and I'm sure you know that already. Now, the, the last slide we'll have is optional tools that I keep in my inventory, and that's just because of the nature of what I do to help support customers. The one thing that I will recommend for you guys is a cellular modem device with an RJ45, because if you get to that store, the internet was working during the site survey, and it is not now, that Netgear will save you in downtime for attempting to troubleshoot. So you can plug that cellular, cellular device in and get active internet connectivity and we can support you. Um, On-site installation. We'll take a look at mounting the, uh, the secure zone router. It must be mounted, I'm sorry, not horizontally, vertically, <laughs> up and down. I always get that wrong. Danny laughs at me. <laughs> so it, Every the, time. the reason why we, we mount it vertically is because it's a passively cooled system. It's, it's, it has no fan. It can withstand harsh environments such as a sea store um, out in the field, outside in, in extreme temperatures. The one thing we need to make sure is that we have a solid cloud light. It needs to be solid green. If it's solid green, that means you have an active internet connection. From there, you'll plug in all Gilbarco devices into the switch per the site survey, and then you'll want to call the Acumara knock to register it, any devices that you have. 
this will allow all devices to communicate with each other. So if you have a problem, you know, uh, make sure you call the Acumera knock. Now we, we do have some, some questions that were raised in the past on the back office PC. The second NIC was used for communicating on that 10, 5, 60. I think it was a 15 dot address, which the NIC was configured at. That was the old way of communicating with the RVO 42. The new way, the second NIC is no longer needed. It can be disabled. Um, the NIC, the primary computer NIC will be the one that is going to be used for communication. And you'll need to provide that IP address from the back office PC so we can create the rule which allows communication from the PC to the passport server. Yeah, so I think, and, and you may have a slide that speaks to this, and I apologize if I'm getting ahead, but on the back office PC, so the thing to remember, again, the DMZ port was, was what used to be on that uh, secondary NIC. That one's going away, so we're not using the DMC anymore. We need to be sideways or parallel with the SER. So the SER and the back office PC will typically be on the same network source. So like if you're plugged directly into a into the carrier modem, for instance, they'll both be plugged into the same modem. And that's what allows that communication to really work there. Right. We've seen instances where we had one we had to troubleshoot really, really of a very long time because there were actually two Hughes modems. One was for the customer's uh, local network and the other one was for payment processing. And each one was plugged into the PC was plugged into one Hughes and the payment processor was plugged into the other Hughes. That will not work. They need to reside on the same customer network. Uh, for payment processing, um, payment networks will vary by brand. This seems to be one of the Achilles heels that that seems to be problems out in the field. Um, ask yourself a few questions, you know, is the payment processing changes, is, is it going from unbranded to a Chevron? Who knows? Um, what is the payment hardware? What is the connection type and the IP address of the equipment? One thing that we can uh, reiterate for you guys is follow the payment processors configuration manual or guide for that setup. Um, determine what connections need to be made where. And part of that is downloading or retrieving that that specific guide for the brand or the make and model of the uh, processing device. So if you can have that on hand, that helps us help you troubleshoot. And always remember that, you know, we can't reiterate this enough is is follow the payment processors manual. Um, that part for me is is one that's challenging when we have to do multiple calls to and from vendors. Um, sometimes we receive the answer we want, sometimes we don't. But like we said, if you have any questions, just call the Acumara knock and we're here to help you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're glad to help you try to figure that out. Uh, just remember our our um, visibility into that is even less than yours. And so we're, we'll do the best we can, but there's only so much. There's uh, some things we know, some things we don't. Right. So. Um, I've included a few examples of what it looks like before and after an install. Um, this is an actual install that I was on. So that's the before. That's the rack where you can see somewhere towards the top, the little blue mounted switch. That's the Acumera. It's a, it's a looks like a 24 port switch. Um, and then if you look at the after, you can see that our footprint is very small. Um, Everything's tie wrapped, so there's no confusion as to what it is. That's the Acumera um, secure zone router. That's a cellular modem and a power strip. So we'll look, take a look at one more example. That's the before of what it looks like whenever there's just wires everywhere. It's chaos. So if you look at the next slide, the after, that's our footprint. And if you notice, everything can be mounted vertically, even the switch. So don't be afraid to, you know, mount it any way you want. That can be a sideways mount. It can be an up and down mount. Um, just make sure that the easiest thing to do is to cable tie everything to make it look nice and neat. And especially if we have issues where this is in a closet and multiple people pass that equipment and we want to ensure there's no downtime because they accidentally unplug something. So one last thing we have is for post installation. Um, Currently right now, and Danny can correct me, I believe only Chevron requires that we uh, Mac lock and port lock. This is very important. You may not ever be on a Chevron install, but if you are, just realize that hot swapping is no longer allowed and that you can't just unplug a device and plug it in and it will work like the old RVO 42. 
um, what you'll need to understand is that, um, and this was brought up in Gil Barco's webinar, that you'll need to unlock the Mac or unlock the port. We'll remove the old device. You'll plug in the new one. We'll register it, apply the policy that it needs, and then we're going to lock it back. So anytime you have a problem where you don't feel like you're getting communication with the device, call the Acumara knock and we'll notify you. And this brings back another question to a well, the prior question we had is if the technicians would get access to the AccuVigil dashboard. If Gilbarco does give that, you guys would be able to see and reflect into AccuVigil and, and verify if the port's locked or not locked. Mm -hmm. And it, it'll make it easier for you guys to troubleshoot. And, and keep in mind, too, this is post-activation. So this is yeah. after the day of install. We're not going to lock any kind of switches down before y'all are on site working on this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Uh, so let's, let's start at the very bottom here. So uh, can the, the switches be mounted in the rack? Yes, the switches can mount however, however it works easiest for you to mount them. They can be mounted in a rack, they can be mounted on a wall, on a shelf, uh, however it works. It's really only the SER that we ask be mounted in that vertical position. And again, that's just for the cooling. Um, let's see. So do you need to provision a site that is using a data wire connected to the EDH? Uh, if I understand the provisioning, it still needs to be activated. Uh, there will not be a payment device as far as we're concerned because it's connecting using serial uh, to the EDH as far as that data wire is, con is concerned. Uh, what we are looking at are devices that are connecting through IP address. Uh, so it's everything that we're dealing with is IP based. The EDH connection with that serial connection payment device on the downside, that's all taken care of through the routing from the EDH. Um, excuse me. And so that's, uh, so yes, we have to provision as in that we have to activate, but no, there's not any special, uh, there's no special uh, registration or anything that needs to be done for the payment on that one. Uh, let's see, from David. Uh, it's important to tell the back office vendor not to change the static IP when we get it connected. Uh, I would agree with that, yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, the important thing on that is just once we get everything connected is we don't want those IP addresses to change because that's how you guys have got everything mapped and so it all needs to stay the same both on your side and ours. Uh, let's see, what's going on with the 21T template? Is the SER survey different from an IQ Um I don't know. I tell you what, let me, I'm not aware of that off the top of my head. Let me check on that and I will see if I can get back on this from Jason. Um, so let me, I don't have that at my fingertips, but I will look at that and I'll see if I can get that out to you. Uh, again, my name is Danny. It'll be anybody else who has that same question with the 21T template, then uh, I'd be glad to uh, let me know uh, and I'll see if I can maybe broadcast that out or something. Um, let's see. Oops, where did that go? Use had one of my techs add a static route to the back office PC to talk to their Fortinet, wondering why. Um, again, looking at not being able to see the site, I'm gonna have to guess a little bit here, but my guess would be that that back office PC was probably not set on the same network segment as the Acumara box. And when that happens, they can't natively talk to each other because they're on two different IP sets. Like the, the SDR would be on like a 192.168, for instance, in the back office on a 172.16, um, for instance. And in that case, yes, they would have to create a special routing rule. Uh, for those of you who are on Chevron Mako sites, you're familiar with this because the, uh, the SDR and the back office PC are not on the same network segments, but Mako has created the routes that allow that communication between the ports. Uh, it'd be the same thing with that use Fortinet. There must have been some kind of uh, that 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 basically that needed extra uh, extra TLC because it was not on that direct can uh, that same network. Um, okay, from Randy, when you say Mac lock, what if we change motherboard? Will that be locked out? Um, that depends, Randy, on whether or not there, there's an onboard NIC. Uh, that Mac locking is going to go by device MAC address. And so if the MAC address changes, then the device will change. If it does not, then it will not. And so that's really going to be, uh, again, an individual thing uh, that I can't say 100%. Probably not, but maybe yes. Um, how does the BOS get access to the internet without using dual NIC? <laughs> 
that uh, the back office will it will wind up connecting that primary NIC will be connected to the internet source. Um, and so that's where it will be pulling internet from at that point, instead of going through the DMZ port. Uh, it's just that there will be a separate rule that's created on our side to route that traffic from the BOS or the back office system to the passport server. And we create that rule on our side to allow that traffic to pass through. Uh, let's see, some customers uh, are wanting rem to have remote access to Passport. Would that be an offering at any time? I do not have an answer to that. That would be a Gilbarco question. That uh, Gilbarco does have remote access. Whether or not that would ever be passed on to, to the end user or the client, I do not know. I'm afraid I can't, I cannot speak to that, unfortunately. Uh, let's see, is the data wire connected to the Acumera? Um, if I'm understanding where this is going, the data wire. And again, this is where we're we're trying to feel our way out because this is not uh, the that network device is not something I've ever personally seen. If it's connected with an IP address, then yes, it will be connected to the Acumera to the it'll be connected to the Acumera switch. If it's connecting through serial through the EDH, then no, it'll connect it'll still connect by serial to the EDH. Um, so that's a that's a question that I'd have to say yes and no. <laughs> um, Let's see. Uh, we've, done, we've already spoken about that one. And I think that is, uh, I think that's got us caught up to date. Uh, we'll go back through this and make sure there's not any questions that I've missed. Uh, if there are, then we'll get back with you directly. Uh, oh, wait, a new one, sorry. Uh, can we connect DataWire Micronode to zone router managed switch to get static IP? Again, if it has an Ethernet cable, uh, if it has an Ethernet connection, then yes. If it has a serial connection, then no, is the, is the quick and dirty answer to that. Um, and so it's, it's not that it's not allowed, it just depends on what equipment it has and how it connects in. Yeah, so, uh, so basically, uh, getting a comment here that the data wire connects to the internet then through the EDH with serial connection. And so that's kind of where, uh, so I guess that that's that same thing where it's basically still going to connect to the EDH and it will still uh, connect just that way. There's not any special provisioning that's being done on that. Um, I think. So I can maybe <clears throat> go ahead, make Nick. one comment. Sorry, this is Nick. Um, just want one comment on the um, on, on the data wire. Some of that will depend on um, the new software load that's going on the, on the passport. So if it's a Cisco branded, there are new software loads that encrypt the um, data or encrypts the credit card transaction natively. So um, you know that's something that again you know give a call into the knock um, and we can we can figure out you know if we can eliminate that data wire or not. So in some cases we can. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, this is Nick. I wanted to, you know, kind of wrap things up one, um, again, thank you so much for your time. I know, I know y'all are extremely busy out in the field. Uh, hopefully we've added, um, some value here. Um, and again, welcome your feedback. What we're, we're going to do is go ahead and we're going to, um, sum up all of these questions with answers and get them out to y'all along with, um, the, the, the deck that we use today. Um, you know, again, looking for feedback and how we can we, we can improve this. This is going to be the first in kind of a series of um, of webinars we're doing, where we will have another one that's going to address the Verifone um, MNSP program. Um, so stand by for you know for uh, that. Uh, we also are working on a Acumera certification uh, program, which will be a real light, but will give you some also some kind of essential. Um, essential skills that will help you in really any any install, be it a, a secure zone router where Acumera is in place. Um, so wanted to, is this the last, is this the last mm -hmm. slide? Okay, oh, good, so. good. So again, I think if, if we take nothing else away from this, I'd like to say, hey, any questions, call the knock. We'll go ahead and get Slade and Danny's contact information out to you so you can reach out to them directly as well. Um, and, and also as, as part of, um, yeah, as part of this uh, certification program, um, we want to offer out to y'all, in addition to these webinar, this webinar format, we have some additional resources that are available to you and your, 
uh, and your teams. And that's in the in the form of, you know, we're, we're going to be putting on some regional trainings where we can come on site. We'll have an edge, a passport edge. We'll have a merchant gateway. We can do training there. We're open to coming out and doing on site trainings at your offices. If, we, if you've got a team there that we want to come out and do an on site. Or we'd love to do that with y'all. And also, you know, if you've got a you know a multi-site install coming up where it's maybe a little bit more complex, we can also provide on-site at the actual install support. We can coordinate that with your service uh, managers um, on that. And um, so again, a lot of different ways that we we want to be able to enable and help you guys to be successful out in the field. Um, and you know, I think it's it's important to to note as well that if if your end user customer is having additional challenges with their network above and beyond just the secure zone router, and they need help with perimeter security services, please have that end user contact. And I'll send out my contact information as well. Have them contact us because there's a lot that Acumera can do to help the end user um, solve a lot of problems, not just the SER. But again, our focus for this is to help you get that SER in and get them you know, processing um, and uh, getting remote support from GoBarco going. Um, but again, we'll send out that contact information. Please um, uh, please provide us some feedback on how we can make this better and, and more valuable for y'all. 